what I thought is most of you are now you have made the compound, right? Uh, you are going to go over the recrystallization in lab, but that also does not confirm whether your product is formed or not, right? So, there are various ways in which we go uh, and try to characterize a compound in the end, right? So, there are various kinds of spectroscopic methods, then some other determination methods that we go through. So, so as to make sure that this is the molecule that we are getting to, right. So, for example, some of the molecules will have a characteristic UV visible peak, then some of the molecules, if you are going to change the functional group in a molecule, you will have a characteristic functional group peak in the IR, okay. More often we do see the NMR of the compound where uh, the entire structure is kind of determined whether this is the molecule that you wanted to create and that is what you have created, right. Then you will go through a mass spec which, which will tell you what is the mass of the molecule that you have created, so that uh, you can then correlate and figure out if your product is right or wrong, right. So, once we have gone through all of such methods, then we say okay, I have formed the right compound. I formed the right molecule I wanted to, right. Right now, you, what you have is a white or yellow powder, you do not know what it is really, right. So, uh, what we are going to do now is we are going to go over two of these methods, the first one is IR and the second one is UV Viz, okay. So, today and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow especially since we are making dyes, we are going to do the UV Viz of those compounds, okay, because they are very nice, they absorb light in the UV visible region and uh, sorry, exhibit color in the UV visible region, right. So, that you can see nice bright colors for tomorrow's compounds. Today, uh, what is, what does it absorb in? UV region, right. So, it is a part of sunscreen. So, what we are going to do is, we will slowly go over the fundamentals of these two spectroscopies. So, uh, before we go to any spectroscopic technique, what we need to understand is, what is light? right or what is electromagnetic radiation for that matter. So, we all know that light is not white as we really know, but it can be split into 7 colors, right. So, this is the visible region from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, we have the visible region, but it is a very small part of the whole spectrum. So, if you see this whole Vibgyor, that is a very small part of the entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, right. So, it goes from gamma rays to long radio waves, right. And which one has the highest frequency? Gamma rays, right. And which one has the lowest frequency? It is the radio waves, right. And wavelength increases in the opposite direction. So, which one will have the highest energy? gamma rays because E equal to H C by lambda, right. So, you are dividing by the wavelength, right. So, gamma rays will have the highest energy, okay. Now, when we are talking about I R, we are talking just below the visible region. Everybody can see that I R range, okay. So, that is where we are going to, uh, that is the energy that we are going to give to our molecules, okay. So, energy corresponding to the IR zone is what we are giving to our molecules, so that they get excited, okay. So, when these molecules, different molecules are radiated or they are given this energy, what happens is they will start vibrating. This energy, IR, the energy in the IR uh, region is good enough to make the bonds vibrate. Okay, such that they will either start stretching, okay, you will see stretching, then you will see some kind of bending or you know there are various types of stretching and bending movement. So, there is a symmetric stretch, stretching, so this is a symmetric stretching. Then there is an asymmetric stretching, so something like this can happen, right. So, imagine me to be uh, a carbon and then there are these two hydrogens right here, my hands are two hydrogens, so they can move like this, they can move like this. So, you know, uh, there are different kinds of stretching vibrations, there are different kinds of bending vibrations. So, there is wagging and then twisting, all of these are possible as you shine energy on that molecule. That molecule is going to gain that energy and the bonds are going to start vibrating, okay. 
So, this is what is going to happen um, as molecules start vibrating and in order to tell you about the instrument itself, I think it is better if we see the video. Infrared spectrometry helps chemists to identify the functional groups present in a compound. They can therefore help in finding the structure of a compound. A pair of atoms joined by a covalent bond can be thought of as being like balls on the end of a vibrating spring. The bond can vibrate with different amounts of energy at a frequency that depends on the masses of the atoms and the strength of the bond. Lighter atoms give higher frequencies. Heavier atoms move more slowly and so give lower frequencies. Stronger bonds give higher frequencies and weaker bonds lower ones. At room temperature, most bonds will vibrate with the lowest possible amount of energy. But if radiation of the right frequency is supplied, the bond can absorb energy and vibrate with greater amplitude. Most bonds absorb energy in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which corresponds to heat. Each bond, such as OH, C double bond O, NH and so on, absorbs at a particular frequency and this allows it to be identified. For historical reasons and because the numbers are easy to work with, chemists dealing with IR spectra use units called wave numbers, measured in centimetres to the minus one, which are proportional to frequency. All IR instruments have a source of IR radiation. This is a coil of wire surrounded by a ceramic capsule, which is heated electrically so that it gives out IR radiation. In other words, heat over a whole range of frequencies. The IR radiation goes via a series of mirrors into the sample, which is placed here in an appropriate holder. The radiation not absorbed by the sample arrives at a detector situated here. Modern instruments, such as this one, use a device called an interferometer, consisting of a beam splitter here, and a pair of mirrors at right angles to one another. This produces what is called an interferogram from the source radiation. The interferogram holds information about the intensity of all infrared radiation at all frequencies simultaneously. This passes through the sample and to the detector. The interferogram that arrives at the detector can be decoded by a mathematical technique called a Fourier transformation. This gives the intensity of the infrared radiation at each frequency separately. The transformation is handled by the computer and produces a graph of percentage transmission against wave number. This is what the chemist interprets. The essential point is that pulses of infrared radiation consisting of a range of frequencies simultaneously are passed through the sample and arrive at the detector. Some frequencies are absorbed more than others, depending on what bonds are present in the sample. This is the sample holder. The sample is placed here on a crystal which is made of diamond or germanium. The IR beam is directed into the sample by a mirror. It is reflected back from the upper surface of the sample before being guided into the detector by a second mirror. This method is called attenuated total reflection, or ATR. Here, we will run the IR spectrum of solid benzoic acid. The instrument is switched on and a blank is run with no sample in place. This is to find the absorption of the air, which must be subtracted from that of the sample. A little benzoic acid is placed on the ATR crystal. This is a holder for solid samples. Less than a milligram of solid sample is required. The torque wrench is used to squash the sample to ensure a good contact with the surface of the crystal. For most samples, no preparation is required. Details of the scan are entered into the computer. 
the spectrum of the sample is obtained within a few seconds. The wave numbers of the more significant peaks can be labelled onto the spectrum. This helps the chemist to interpret the data. This peak is caused by a stretching vibration of the C double bond O and this by an OH stretch. These two peaks together suggest that the sample may have a carboxylic acid functional group which has both C double bond O and OH bonds. An unknown sample may be identified by matching its IR spectrum with a database of spectra of known compounds, particularly in the region of the spectrum below about 1500 centimetres to the minus one. The peaks in this area are due to complex vibrations of the whole molecule, and the area is referred to as the fingerprint region because it is unique for a particular compound. For a liquid sample, the procedure is the same, but a few drops of liquid are placed in this type of sample holder. The cover is to prevent the evaporation of volatile liquid samples. Okay, so what did we pretty much see in the video? So it was so I wanted to show you because it shows the inside of the instrument which is typically very difficult to see what all parts are there and you know what all happens as you. So what, what did we see? Can anyone summarize? What is the instrument doing? In a very simple language, no need to use. So it's detecting the functional group. How is it detecting the functional group? Through the peak. So what it is doing is basically it is giving IR radiation. Okay, so there is a source, IR source that we all saw. It is casting those or giving those IR radiations on the sample, right? It's basically at, at in the beginning kind of splitting the radiations into two parts such that you have one comparison and one that goes through the sample. So you can always compare which all, uh, which all frequencies are getting absorbed by the sample, right? So what we saw is that every bond, every two atoms can be kind of considered as uh, two masses attached by a spring, right? So for example, a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, I can imagine that a hydrogen-hydrogen bond is basically two masses attached by a spring. Same thing with carbon-hydrogen, carbon-oxygen, carbon double bonded oxygen, you know all of these bonds you can kind of imagine them to be attached by a spring, right? Now different springs have different spring constants, right? So uh, anybody remembers the Hooke's law that we learnt in physics, which tells us about the, yeah, what is the frequency? Everybody knows that it tells you about the frequency, but what is the frequency equivalent to? Okay, so frequency is proportional to what? root of, anybody remembers? I, I can hear somebody knows the right answer. Root of k by k by mu, right? Mu is the reduced mass, right? Of, uh, so if you see here, these two masses K is the spring constant, right? K is the spring constant, how tight or how loose the spring is. If it is very, very loose, then K will be lower. If it is a very tight spring, then it is going to be a higher K, right? Mu is given by, let us say these two masses are M1 and M2, then mu is equal to Okay, everybody knows that, good, right? 
So, we are going to apply the same thing to our bonds, okay. carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon oxygen bonds, we are going to apply the same formula. Okay. So, now you tell me between a carbon carbon single bond, a carbon carbon double bond, which one will vibrate at a higher frequency? Okay, think about it again. So, why is the double bond vibrating at a higher frequency? Stronger bonds, so higher K, right? Mu is the same, both of them are carbon carbon bonds, right? So, mu is m1 m2 over m1 plus m2. So, 12 into 12 over 12 plus 12, that is how what you can think of it to be, right? So, mu is the same in both cases, but k is changed. This one has a higher k, right. So, carbon carbon double bond will be vibrating at a higher frequency. What about carbon carbon triple bond? Even more, right. So, carbon carbon triple bond will be even higher frequency, right. Now, tell me between, uh, let us look at this, let us go here. So, let us see if our first product prediction was right. Carbon carbon single bond is vibrating between 0 to 500. So, wave number is nothing but very similar to frequency, right. So, this is between 0 to 1500, carbon carbon double bond will be between 1500 to 2000 around, triple bond is between 2000 to 2500. So, your that prediction was right. Same goes for carbon nitrogen double bonds and carbon nitrogen triple bonds, you can also see that trend, right. So, why is the single bond NH, OH and CH vibrating at a higher frequency? So, carbon carbon single bond versus carbon hydrogen single bond. So, let us compare CC versus CH, these two. Why is carbon, this is also a single bond? this is also a single bond. So, why is one vibrating at a lower frequency, one vibrating at a higher frequency? What is changed? What is the frequency proportional to root of k by mu? k, let us say it is a single bond, let us assume that it is kind of similar, right. What about mu? Mu is changed, right. So, what what is the mass in, in case of carbon carbon versus carbon hydrogen? So, this is what? Sorry, uh, by 24, right? And in this case, what is the case? Uh, right? Which one is more than 1, which one is less than 1? Right. So, now you can see why one of them is, since this is less than 1, right, you are dividing by something less than 1. So, it is going to go to a higher number, right, root of k by mu. If mu is less than 1, then the frequency is going to increase. Can everyone relate to all, all the numbers here, meaning why is one bond in this 2500 to 4000, 4, why is some other bond between 2000 and 2500? Right. So, depending on the compound that we are making, we should be able to see peaks in that region. Okay. Now, tell me today we went from benzaldehyde to benzaldehyde and acetone to DBA. Right. So, what did we have? We had a benzaldehyde, we had acetone and it is going to change to DBA. So, let us look at benzaldehyde, where all do you expect the peaks? of benzaldehyde, C double bond O. So, let me write that down here. So, benzaldehyde. So, first of all, I will also have C double bond C's. So, this will be seen in this region. All these carbon carbon double bonds will be seen in that region, right. So, I should see peaks between 1500 and 2000 that are for the C double bond C and C double bond O, right. How do I distinguish peaks between C double bond C and C double bond O? Anybody has done IR before or some of your third year students, right. 
how do I know which one is C double bond C and which one is C double bond O? Sorry? No, no, on the IR you are going to see peaks for both, right? You get a spectrum. Now there are peaks for both these double bonds. How do I know which one is which? So, IR unfortunately does not tell you how many there are, okay. So, spectroscopy in this case IR spectroscopy does not tell you how many bonds are there, but it will just show a presence meaning it is there or not, right. Now, in case of carbon, carbon double bond when the bonds are stretching there is not a huge dipole moment change, okay. Whereas, when a carbon oxygen double bond stretches there is a significant dipole moment change as the stretching happens, right. So, carbon oxygen double bond you will see kind of goes all the way down. So, kind of goes all the way down like this. Carbon carbon double bond is kind of shorter or we call it a weak to medium peak, okay. So, carbon carbon double bond we see a little shorter than carbon oxygen, carbon oxygen goes all the way to the bottom pretty much. Same way for car single carbon oxygen bond, carbon oxygen single bond that also goes all the way down, okay. So, this is how I can distinguish between these two peaks, okay. So, that is benzaldehyde, acetone will be similar, right. Now, DBA what will you see in DBA? compare your starting material benzaldehyde and look at DBA. What peak is going missing? Sorry? There is a C double bond C in DBA as well, right? C double bond O is also there in acetone, it is also there in DBA, right? So, that, that also not a great peak for comparison. Any other peak that you can think about that is there in the starting materials, but is getting converted or changed as we go to the final products. Is it OH2? We do not have OH2 in the starting OH group. Do we have an OH in the starting material? No, right. So, benzaldehyde and acetone has a particular bond that is not there in DBA. CH bond of the aldehyde, right. So, benzaldehyde that C double bond OH, right. this particular CH group in the aldehyde is getting converted in the final product. You do not have that bond anywhere, right. We typically see CH bond of an aldehyde around 2750, okay. So, what we are going to see when we look at the starting material IR and end product IR is that do, do I have a peak in the starting material which is around 2750 that of the benzaldehyde? Yes. When we go to the product IR has that peak gone away, right, because my molecule is no longer there, right, my benzaldehyde is converted now. So, this is what basically IR we use for. We look in, in organic chemistry we are mainly using it to detect the presence of a particular functional group, okay. Again, we cannot estimate how many molecules there, there are, but we are going to estimate if it is there or not, okay. So, we are going to look at the starting material IRs, look at the functional groups that we want to observe. So, for example, if you have an alcohol and you are oxidizing it to a ketone, right, you are going to look for loss of that OH peak and the gain of C double bond OH peak in the product. So, which peak is getting down? which peak is going up that is something we are going to see down meaning uh, the presence is not there and which peak starts appearing as the product forms, okay. So, now here I have some characteristic IRs, okay. Now, let us we have not really discussed this, but CH peaks are a 
little different when the CH sorry when the CH group is C single bond H or sp3 CH, sp2 CH and sp CH. Okay, meaning the the carbon is a triple bonded carbon, a double bonded carbon, or a single bonded or a sp3 hybridized carbon. So, what trend would you predict in these? So, which one will be higher? Which one will be lower? SP SPCH bond will be higher. Why is that? What is higher in case of? No, but the number of bonds, it is still the same one bond that we are looking at, right? It is still the single bond that we are looking at. So, it is not the number of bonds, the number of bonds is the same. In each case, we are just looking at a CH bond just that carbon is differently hybridized in each case, right. So, what should change? Why are you calling that SP3, SPCH to be higher? You are right, it, it, it does show a higher frequency. Why does it show a higher frequency? Sorry? It is triple bonded on the other side, but what about this bond? See again, it is not going to have do you see like that triple bond is different, but this single bond is also vibrating. So, when a molecule vibrates, it is not like this triple bond is vibrating and then this single bond stops vibrating or something. It is going to vibrate at both ends, right. Now, we are talking about the SPCH single bond. What is going to happen? You are saying something. So, why is it stronger? So, you are right, it is stronger. SPCH bond is stronger than SP2CH, and SP2CH is stronger than SP3CH, but why is it stronger? Sorry? Percentage of S character, right? So, there is a higher amount of S character, right? Percentage of S character, there is more overlap, right? So, SPCH, if you see in an alkyne, see where that SPCH is coming out to be? It is coming out to be at around 32 or 3300, okay? SP2CH is around 3100 and SPCH is around or oh sorry SP3CH is around close to 2900 to 3000, okay. So, today for DBA you should see a CH peak at around 3100 because that is where your SP2CH peaks are, right. But if you look at this octane, this thing, you do see a carbon-carbon triple bond at around 21. 20, right? And you do see a CH stretch. All of these other stretches are sp3 CH stretches. See, they are just below 3000, okay? So, now you see the difference between sp3 CH and sp CH, okay? Let us go further. Now, what is happening here? So, the, there was a if this was one octane, so that means the triple bond was at the terminal end, terminal carbon. But when I go to two octane, this carbon carbon stretch kind of triple bond stretch goes away. So, what is happening there? Why did it go away? That bond is vibrating, right? That carbon carbon triple bond in two octane still vibrates. So, why do not I see it? What did I talk about when I, when I was telling you about carbon-carbon double bond and carbon-oxygen double bond? What changes? Mass changes, but also 
dipole moment changes, right. So, when I am looking at this, the carbon carbon triple bond stretch in, in, in an internal octane that is the, the triple bond is inside the molecule somewhere not at the end, there is very little dipole moment change happening. So, that will not be seen, okay. Does not mean that it is not there, but you also have to be aware that sometimes in IR, if there is not much dipole moment change, you would not see it, right. Again, if you s compare it from previous spectrum, since this is 2 octane and there is no SPCH present in the molecule, you do not have anything here at 3200, right. See, this one was there because there was a terminal carbon triple carbon carbon triple bond there is no terminal carbon carbon triple bond so you don't have it in this okay so alkanes for example will show you just ch stretches right carbon carbon stretches are there but those are not typically there those are below 1500 so we don't look at the fingerprint region typically okay for characterization we only focus on 1500 to 4000 region so you have a ch stretch for alkanes Alkenes for example, will have a CH stretch, but do you see this small peak at 3083? That is because of that sp2 CH, okay. Remember sp2 CH shows up around 3100, so it will be seen there, right. Now carbon-carbon double bonds in the case of for example, toluene. You can see those carbon carbon double bond stretches around 1600 and 1475. Okay, I will give you the uh, like ranges of different groups and functional groups, but right now just look at the peaks and tell me what do you see. So, this is an amine. Now, you kind of tell me where each peak is, I will try to label it. So, you see the formula on top. Yeah. NH is where? The longest, okay. Actually, if you look at the range of NH, it starts somewhere above 3000, right? These are the NH peaks, okay. Just about 3000, what we typically more often always see is the CH peak, okay. Everybody with me? So, these are the two main peaks again something below 1500 do not pay attention to that. Alcohols again this is the OH peak and these are the CH peaks. Now, why is that alcohol peak like bend and U shaped kind of a thing? Typically the peaks that you saw were very sharp. So, this one is kind of smooth and U. Anybody has any guesses? So, remember this is about stretching that OH bond in alcohol, right? OH bond is stretching and that is the peak we are observing, but that OH bond is not just that hydrogen is not just forming a bond with that oxygen. It is also forming a hydrogen bond with some other molecule, right? Sorry. So, because of which what is going to happen is that stretching is not going to be a single stretching just for that one molecule, right. When this molecule stretches, it is going to affect the other alcohol molecule and that also is going to stretch. So, you do not have a singular one single independent stretch of one molecule happening. So, for alcohols we typically see this U shaped thing when there is a lot of hydrogen bonding. Okay. Ketones, where is this C double bond O? As I said, it will be really down all the way down to the end of the spectrum because there is a large dipole moment change as C double bond O. So, C double bond O peaks are very typical peaks to recognize. Okay. In our case, unfortunately, our starting material is also a C double bond has a C double bond O end product also has a C double bond O. So, it is very difficult to figure out which one is which, but you should be able to see some shift 
in the sense your starting material acetone for example or benzaldehyde where uh, the the place at which it shows you c double bond o your dbi is not going to show you the same same frequency it's going to be a different frequency still in the range of 1500 to 2000 but it will be different aldehydes now this is important to us right for today's experiment the ch peak 2750 to 2800 right what do we see we see that ch characteristic a very small peak kind of coming down okay that is what we are going to look for the loss of this peak will tell us whether the benzaldehyde has converted completely okay and the last one carboxylic acids what do you see again that why is it such a broad peak here because of oh what does it do there is a hydrogen bonding in fact carboxylic acids exhibit a dimer kind of a structure right two carboxylic acid molecules are typically forming a hydrogen bond with each other right so what you have is a dimer of a carboxylic acid and you do see these oh peaks these ch peaks and that c double bond o peak is also very characteristic for carboxylic acids so any questions regarding ir so we will do ir today we will look at how the your starting material benzaldehyde has changed to dba and we will look at the presence or absence of the corresponding peaks okay yeah do you have any questions regarding ir yes the dipole moment change right that that intensity is proportional to the change in the dipole moment as the bond stretches or vibrates so today in the lab what you are going to see is we don't have an atr but we are going to make a kbr pellet okay so we are going to grind our compound along with kbr which is a salt kbr is not going to give you a signal so we are going to grind it together and make a pellet or make a thin film out of which through which we pass the compound and we see uh, i mean rest of the ir functioning is pretty much same just that one extra step is added to our uh, way of sample preparation okay any other questions so we'll i think we'll cover uv vis tomorrow okay i will go over uv vis tomorrow today we'll go back and start doing the rest of the lab filtre sorry decrystallization melting point ir and you will okay